Okay, I'm going to welcome everybody. Um, the end is nigh. <laughs> Not the day of the Lord, but the end of the New Testament. Uh, today is June. Yes. I hope you had enough time this week to read it. Uh, right, right. It's a little longer than John. <laughs> so, um, but this book is interesting. It's just downright interesting on many levels. And so we'll get into that in a second. But first of all, I just want to map out. Uh, next week, I um, will not be here and we're just not going to do it because it's we want to start Revelation. I want to be there for that. Um, so we have two weeks on Rep. So we're going to take a week off next week. I'm traveling to the um, to Wisconsin, oh, wow. <laughs> place, way up north, Tomahawk. Oh, way up, way up north. We're going at the end of September. Clay Schmidt, you know who's on our family? Yeah, 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 they've got a um, a summer place, and uh, beautiful. Yeah, we were up there last year. We were running back to retreat. Um, just to praise his wife, he he he. Um, she's a good cook. She was a high level lawyer, but what she does to relax is cook. But she she really gets into the details. So we're driving up, and Clay says, You know, you really should get tonight that she does fish and chips like nobody else, oh, just fish and chips. And and he said, But I gotta know if that's what you want, because she's gotta go out and catch the fish. <laughs> so it was fresh fish and chips, but you know the, the sauce that goes with it. Part of sauce. She makes it from scratch. Oh wow! And that was kind of consistent. You do too. I do. Of course, I do. Of course, you do. Of course you do. But you like straight fish. I like it. All right. Well, but it was everything. So, so he made us Manhattans. Uh, so, she makes her own dark cherries. Oh, <laughs> And she makes her own bitters to go to Manhattan. Oh, who does that? She so makes her own bitters, right? <laughs> no. I mean, I'm just saying she likes all, it's not just Natural. the cooking, it's all the, uh, even the okay. side things. See, she well, just does what it. What does she have for dessert? What does she have? Well, I was just thinking about the peas. Normally, you know, scoop of peas. She puts it in this homemade pie crust. So mm -hmm. it's oh. delicate and Oh, well, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's so I'm why I'm going to drive all that way and wait for it out. Up to the right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. What's that? That sounds like it's going to be I've great. been struggling the whole time. Well, well, I think you should stay an extra week <laughs> because I'm going to be going on that following week. <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned. Yeah, I'll consider that. All right. How, uh, many, how many weeks can we spend on Revelation? Oh. I think, you know, the, the films are two, but we may do an extra uh, one or two of them. Revelation can cause more problems. And yeah, it's a beautiful book. It is a beautiful book, but it's problematic too. Um, it's probably the most misused, the great martyr of, of the Bible is the book of Revelation. Um, Luther is famously, you know, said in critique, a book with the name Revelation should reveal something, you know. It abuses. But then he went and got in trouble with it. He got in trouble. Uh, he interpreted it um, over against the Jews when the Jews did not convert. He was sure it was the last days, the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And he knew the book of Revelation said then uh, the children of Israel would then convert in mass. And when they did, he got upset. So again, it's it's that book that gets everybody in trouble. And yet it's beautiful. As I mentioned last week, there is no book in the Bible that's, that's used by poets, by artists, by hymn writers more. Literature. Everybody. So it's uh, quite beautiful. So that's what to, um, so we'll do a couple of weeks. We'll just see where the energy is there and, and whether we run into more problems, <laughs> we'll just keep addressing it. I used to have a office next to a colleague, Barbara Wassing, and she was just brilliant on the book of Revelation. So I'll be using a lot. Well, and Craig Kester. Mm. Craig could teach it, but he could also sing it and perform it. I know. That's, I'm mm. going to try to find one of the videos that yeah, he right. did. in Because 
you know, he sings because it's so much of the, our liturgy. Liturgy is there, yeah. yeah. Yep. You know, he's lecturing and then he breaks into song. <laughs> and our own sanctuary it is dominated by big windows up top uh, come from uh, Revelation 21, 22. Um, anytime you have a large altar, you're imagining the book of Revelation where at the end times God gathers us all around the banquet uh, uh, table of the Lamb. Banquet. So again, even our architecture is influenced by the book of Revelation. So we have that this week on the Sunday Forum. I encourage you to watch it like do every week, but this week it's on the sanctuary renovation. Yeah. So I don't know if that was helpful. You got to see a couple of the, the renderings. Yeah. And uh, so it, it'll get you um, prepared for what's going to happen pretty fast. So in October, on October 6th, we are going to stop having nine o'clock worship and 10 o'clock worship. We're going to join together the live service and the nine o'clock service. Put it in the Family Life Center at 9.30. And we're doing that so that everyone's upset. <laughs> we want not just one group to be upset. We want everyone to be upset. <laughs> um, and give us, we're hoping six weeks, what the renovation will take. The hardest thing will be uh, the new pews. Um, I think they've already been ordered. So... Um, <laughs> But redoing the pews would have taken four months. Oh. So making them new, starting mm. new, is cheaper and faster. That makes yeah. no sense to me. Mm -hmm. But there you go. Yes. If you've ever had a chair refinished, like an old oh, wood yeah. chair, and then you kind of yeah. know mm. how painstaking it is, how costly it is, and it takes time. Maybe maybe it's faster to just go out. Well, sure. Are they able to sell those pews or something? I don't know what the plans are. I, hope I we don't, don't think somebody would want them. They're beautiful. I, I, <laughs> the only problem is they're cut only for our sanctuary. Right? They're not can be flat. Cut. They're not re, they're not flat. But when we're back at the, in the in the sanctuary, aren't they going to be doing something in with the live service? Like that? I mean that's where they tell me, will they be doing that at all? No, we'll wait till this is renovated. Then we will move over, probably in January, to have two services at 9 and 10.30. Right? I, Just 9 and 10.30, no live okay. service. So we'll join them in January. Oh, so everything, everything will be at 10.30 for them. So it'll be a new type of service. It'll be kind of a blend between a traditional service That'll and a live nice. service. Yeah. Now I, hope, I hope we give those pews away, not sell them. Yeah. Well, what else? Yeah. 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 There's going to be a church that, that you know, would, that like, they're in great shape, I think. Yeah. And so uh, mm -hmm. for someone, that might be just the ideal thing. But they are uniquely designed. Mm -hmm. Each one is different because it forms a cross facing the cross. Um, so each of them, if you go in there, each of them is cut in catty so that you have straight lines to the cross from the back. And I'm thinking with the live service, if, they, if we, some people get to hear them sing, because their music is beautiful too. Yeah. I mean, our choir is beautiful, but the live music is has the contemporary sound. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, Joyce's daughter, gonna be, I hear her sing. It's beautiful. I mean, because they're really used to it. Yeah. So I think, you know, well, and, and we want to hear Nazareth too. Uh, everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly named. That it means that. So then, uh, uh, on the upcoming weeks uh, for the Sunday Forum, um, uh, Howard will be talking on the fifteenth, right? Fifteenth yeah. about the. Uh, I'll say the opportunity and the crisis in Rwanda. The government, as we oh, know, yeah. as we said, has set standards for the church, for its facilities, and for its clergy. They just don't want willy nilly people coming in and starting storefront churches or, or house churches without training. The result is all of our churches, but one has been closed. Oh, the oh. physical churches. Physical, because they don't have parking, they don't have infrastructure, they don't have maybe adequate restrooms. Like, well, it'd be like what we do here. That's what the government's already saying. It, it, it's, we have standards now. If you don't meet sure. the standards, so. It might be your church is in great shape, but you don't have a lightning rod. Yeah. Or you don't have maybe out in the rural areas, you don't have running water and restaurants. 
mm -hmm. sanitation. So they have to work on the facility side. That's not going to be our task. Our task is to get all their pastors with advanced degrees. And that is absolutely required. Yeah, you so can't call yourself a pastor. Are the churches still meeting, though? So great question. So I said to uh, the assistant bishop, are the pastors doing church under the trees? Like, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and the answer is no, because they would be arrested. Oh, because they're that. not following. Oh, yeah. 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 And they yeah. can't meet in each other's homes, or no, because that probably doesn't mean not them. not more than one family at a time. <laughs> the um, yeah. <laughs> they, the regulations they crack down very significantly. Yeah. So um so the opportunity for us again, uh if we if we get 10, 8, 9, 10 graduated mm -hmm. in January, that brings their count almost about 35% of their clergy that I'm going to have MDOs. So you can see this is a long term project to get them up to the point where a majority of the clergy have MDivs. And like I said, they'll have to turn to someone else for the facilities issues. But uh, so we feel it's a real opportunity. We feel what we're doing here in Emmanuel is a big, it's a big deal. Otherwise the church collapses in one, a whole Lutheran church and it's growing and it's really mm -hmm. doing quite well. The upside is our students are now all handing in their homework. <laughs> They've, uh, it's all of a sudden real serious. They had lagged a little bit earlier this year. Now they're not lagging, you know, because they don't have to plan work as well. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I do want to mention, though, too, we are training future instructors also in Rwanda, mm -hmm. such that, you know, they're, they're fine to call us into perpetuity. But they don't won't need us in perpetuity. Uh, We're mm -hmm. training them to be part of a, a effectively a global system of academic hubs um, <laughs> in North America, Africa, Central South America, et cetera. Which means PhDs and D D minutes. Yeah. If we can get six, eight, ten, then whatever they want to just take over, we can flip instead of us leading and then following, they could lead and we could just do whatever they wanted. So mm -hmm. as you know, that was the classic missionary uh, mistake in the 19th century is we built these churches and built them so they were totally dependent on Western uh, money and, and aid. So we don't yeah. want to do that. We want to put them in strong, which is why our platform, because it's more accessible and it's more affordable, is a perfect model then for Africa. I guess there is, um, I'm thinking maybe I'm totally off base, but uh, is the government trying to like with the stringent rules? I know you need rules and regulations, but it sounds to me almost like they want to squash the religion. I don't know. Like I'm that's my no, maybe they, I'm off. No, um, from what we gather, the church actually agrees with the action, um, even though it, it's hit them hard. Huh. They actually they see what the government's trying to do. The government gave them five years. To prepare, so well, you got time though to be without your church. Yeah, and they, but what they feel is that all these pastors are coming in with teachings that are actually uh, counter uh, development in Rwanda. So there are negative messages, and they feel like most of those are pastors who have not been trained, just don't know what. And we're going to kind of get into that in Jude today. It's very similar. Because in Jude, when he talks about these teachers, um, their behaviors are all over the place. Huh, but they're, as, they're, they're sort of, and I don't mean this in a formal denomination way, they're sort of Pentecostal, a sense of God talks to the teacher, and the teacher gets up and says, this is what God told me. That has maybe no relationship to scripture. Mm -hmm. And people were following them. And there Jude is saying, well, but look at their behavior. Look at their behavior. Their behavior already tells you that their teaching's off base, yeah. but that's kind of what they're working through. That's what's going on at Rwanda. So. Okay, two things. Matt says to say hello to everybody. Awesome. And turn off your phone. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> then uh, lastly, the last week um, will be Pastor Lillier giving us an update on the call committee out at the park. <laughs> Where are we as far as finding leaders? and on building a church out there. Where are we in that project? So 
Okay. I ask a question about that. Um, Pastor Sharon was on the prayer list. And yeah. I wonder what was the problem. I don't know, but she was ill, so she couldn't she, make it. She she didn't make service, which is yeah. really rare. Like the BB, that's why BB was up. Yeah. 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 So that was nice that but even even D was not doing well. I think she had like a oh. an ulcer, is what she was saying. So oh no. She was uh she made it, but she was one thing. She okay now. She feeling yeah. she's definitely feeling better. She's fifty percent. Yeah, better than she had. Well, that. she does the work of three people. Oh, she's like, really. <laughs> well, we really need her to do more. Four, so. <laughs> and, and it's a big thing with the church stewards of assets because they pay her. Well, they, yeah, <laughs> they pay, pay fine. <laughs> All right, so now let's jump. Let's now jump into June. I did want to, to show share those conversations because I think they're important ones especially during uh, the month of September. Um, I was also really happy that um, the video really did well on um, our favorite politicians and the churches to which they belong. It's that one is one of the best watched this year. So that was quite interesting. That usually means people outside the church are watching it, not just our people. And um, Labor Day was good, the one you did on Labor Day. But, um, yeah, it was kind of the classic. Yeah, yeah exactly. Day. All right, June. Or as we're going to hear Judah, uh, turn to Mark chapter 6. Who is Judah? Jesus' brother. brother. Okay, now this is, of course, uh, if, if this was a Roman Catholic class, uh, they would correct me on that. Uh, but we, and there is an argument to be made there. I mean, in Africa, I was often introduced to someone, they say, this is my sister, this is my brother, but that was not their biological sister or brother, that was just sick, like a cousin, right? Or, uh, and we do that too, right? John, John, yeah, here's my uncle. It's not your uncle, but you're so close to them, you find a familiar title, right? Um, we do that all the time. Uh, Mark 6, verse, um, let's go to verse 3. Well, okay. Sure. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at them. And this is this amazing text, first of all, that um, Jesus' own family didn't accept him as Messiah right? early on. So, uh, and you remember even John the Baptist struggles a little. And he's a cousin, a real cousin. Yeah. Um, they're all trying to figure out, and we know this. I mean, you 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 grow up with your own brothers and sisters, and you know they grow up and become pretty accomplished, and and but not in the family. That's still your little sister, right? I mean, you don't. She may be a professor or a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon, but no, that's your little sister. You know, you don't respect degrees in your family or whatever. You have a little bit of a little bit of that with Jesus, you know. The, um, yeah, it's Judah or Judas or Jude. Mm -hmm. So this name pops up in various ways. Uh, but brother of Jesus, like James. So we can see when Jesus rose from the dead, some of the earliest people he came to, we said was James, one of his brothers. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. I mean, it's, I, I want my family as part of the team. But in their writings, they never admit to being his brother. You know, like Jude never says that, or James never says. <clears throat> Probably does, because Jude doesn't have to. Yeah. We need to know this, because we're not of, of, from that okay. era. Uh, but they probably all, all knew this. Now, what we've got here, the audience is Messianic Jews, but we don't know exactly whether it was one community or just in general. So it's a Jewish audience, and they know the Old Testament. They know the apocryphal literature. So we're going to run into the first to the apocryphal. Things, you know, we're not used to talking about. Uh, we're going to talk about first Enoch. Anybody read that? Or the Testament of Moses. Well, certainly you read that. 
<laughs> no, you know, we don't. Uh, most of us don't have Bibles with the Apocrypha in it. Uh, but this was devotional literature. It was well known. So I'm trying to think of uh, who's the uh, the woman Meyer. Joyce Meyer. Joyce Meyer. Okay, grew up Lutheran. Um, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. We've lost some of the best. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how many have read her devotional books? I've read some of them. Yeah. 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 Or sometimes you run into um, Billy Graham and some of his classic devotional books that you know people grew up with, right? And so if in a sermon I were to quote them, you'd say, yeah, I, I know I know that book or I know that piece of literature, right? That's what Jude is doing here. He's referring to these books that his audience, Messianic Jews, Jews who, who accept Jesus as Messiah, all knew stuff they knew. But he's going to quote Old Testament stories, again, that everyone knew. But we have to review because we don't know the Old Testament as well, obviously, his audience. So it's really quite interesting. We have the Apocryphal. This does raise some concerns for the early church fathers. Can you accept a book in the Bible that leans so heavily on the Apocrypha or on any other non-biblical book? For the early church fathers, that was at least a concern. But of course, the response is Paul quotes all sorts of literature that's not biblical in his um, in his letters. You know, he, he refers to the Greeks. He refers to the philosophers. But we know there are other books that are not in the Bible, uh, often referred to as Q or others, that these guys are all reading. They have them in their libraries. They have all in front of them. We just don't know what they are. But we can tell because they're making the same quotes that must be coming from somewhere, right? So early on, that concern kind of died down. Now, the other fascinating element of Jude, I think, is that it's closely related to 2 Peter. So if I could have prepared you for this, I could have said, you know, put 2 Peter up next to Jude, read them both together, and see what you discover. Mm -hmm. 15 of the 25 verses in Jude have a relationship with 2 Peter, either quoted word by word or partially, uh, partially drawn from the verses. So does that mean that Jude has 2 Peter in front of him, or does it mean Peter has Jude in front of him, or is there a third piece, devotional piece, that they're both you know, plagiarizing. Now we call it plagiarism, but in, in that day it's not plagiarism. You're trying to be faithful to the content of the person you copy. So it, it's a way of um, praising your teacher mm -hmm. that you would want to copy what they said almost verbatim, even though you're putting it in your voice. So 15 of 25 verses. That's that's pretty incredible. A and, lot. <laughs> and it's a lot. So that would be a, a worthy exercise. Again, if we could put two Bibles next to each other this morning and, and try to compare Jude and Second Peter. So is it written when? It could be written at the same time as Second Peter, or it could be written later. I've always put it in the 80s, but I don't know. I don't know. It could have been earlier. To, again, it all depends on whether one, who who was first, right? Okay. Uh, finally, we've got those teachers again. Now, just to remind us, we've got all these house churches. And um, just think of your home, and you say, okay, okay. Uh, like out at the park, we, you know, we have a hard time getting permits, so, so we have to go to someone's home to worship. And you say, I got a big home. I don't muck my home for Sunday worship. I can get 50, 60 people, which is probably what they had. It would be a church. And then a really great evangelist comes through. And you say, well, I got a spare bedroom. I'll put them up in the spare bedroom. And that's what we were talking about in Peter, right? It was an issue. 
-hmm. or a job. It's an issue because some of these um, teachers were quite good and others mm -hmm. were not. How do you know? And uh, it's interesting that they use the fish uh, rule. I call it the fish rule. <laughs> yeah. 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 If, if, they, if they're staying longer than you know, three, you're out. <laughs> the, head, the head rots, you know, and uh, three days, whatever. My, my grandmother lived by that. So when she came to visit us, <clears throat> three days she was gone. She always felt that you could uh, outstay your welcome. Exactly. Yeah. And they lived in the families there. So they got, got enough of seeing each other every Sunday anyway. That was kind of the old tradition, the old Swedes and Rockford. Um, so, and my mother was greatly offended by this. She says, You came all the way from Rockford to Maryland at that time. That was quite a trip to stay three days, just three days. But that was the rule. They had all kind of, you know, the fish. It, uh, the old fish starts to stink, I think, you know, on, the, on, the, on the third day. What was the real purpose? Of course, it wasn't psychological or outstaying your welcome. It was financial. Is someone abusing and living off of you um, and, and not having the right motivation for being an evangelist? Here we got the same problem. We got sex, money, and violence. Surprise, surprise, right? Um, what did you gonna have? say, well, some things never change. Um, he's gonna first go at sex, and he's gonna then quote Old Testament text. So he's gonna say, "You remember these stories in the Old Testament, and in First Enoch, and in the Testament, you know, to Moses." And, they're, and of course, there they're all going, "Yeah, they're all nodding their heads. Yeah, we remember those stories." So you're going to talk about um, issues in the wilderness of, of rebellion. You're going to talk about angels having uh, uh, sex with humans. That's not just in First Enoch. You, you've got that in Genesis, right? Do you remember the reference? That the, the, the angels came down and had sex with the humans, create a glorious whatever. And, and Genesis almost suggests that's where the... Um, Nephilim come from. Remember that that um, you're all not nodding. Uh, uh, the Nephilim <laughs> and the giants. Well, where do giants come from? What gives them supernatural size and strength? Where did Goliath come from? Oh, it's distant relative yeah. from these. You would probably say uh, lower gods, divine beings, and they were really attracted to. Um, Women. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of normal behavior for Greek and Roman gods. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the pantheon is filled with, oh, yeah. you know, um, stories yeah. of this god slept with this right. woman right. and it now we have this problem, it. right? And so all the drama, all the divine drama comes from that. You have it in Genesis as well, where it says the sons of God. That means these, these godlike divine creatures came and slept with women, and then you got this problem. And he's going, okay, do you remember those stories? It's always causes a problem, even not only for humans, but for even the gods can't control themselves. And look at look at the look at the problems. It's great. Okay, so we've got wilderness, angels, Sodom, and Gomorrah. Um I don't know if you've read, we have you know, we read that when we did the Old Testament. Um, it's so, so brutal. You can hardly read the story and figure out um, what's being condemned. Because we think, oh, throwing a woman out there to be raped by um, the townsman, that would be bad enough. But that doesn't seem to be the greatest sin in the story. And so uh, it's interesting he just refers to it as Sodom and Gomorrah. And I mention that because often we say, oh, that's a, a certain sin. It's actually in the New Testament referred to as hospitality was the great sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, not sexual immorality. But there you have it here. It's sexual immorality, like those visiting pastors, right? 
They didn't learn from these Old Testament texts. They have direct relationship with God. God tells them what to teach, and they teach it. But they don't live it. That's the whole idea. And, and lifestyle reflects on their bad teaching. So then he'll go to these other stories of Cain and Abel. But Cain, it wasn't just that he killed his brother, but then he set up a city which was violent. And now he's going after violence, right? That Cain couldn't, even at, even at, as God set up, remember these sanctuary cities, or sanctuary city for Cain, so that he'd be safe and people wouldn't come. He sets up a violent city. Uh, Balaam, uh, again, you're probably all nodding. Yeah, I remember Balaam. Balaam was the one who, the priest who, um, non Jewish, the, the Midianite uh, king said, I want you to curse Israel as they're marching through the wilderness, mm -hmm. coming to the promised land. And he couldn't. He actually blessed them, gets in trouble for it. Because the king said, I told you what to do. I want you to curse them and you bless them. <laughs> so then he has another idea. He invites them to an orgy otherwise known as a worship service. <laughs> Church growth technique at the time. That's what it was. Church growth technique. Uh, yeah. We're going to do that here, are we? <laughs> oh, there's the far side. Remember the far side. I remember the one where uh, the, the priest is getting up after you know such a worship service. He says, I just want to thank all the, the virgins who came out last night, did a great job. You know, <laughs> I want you to do a church. All right, we're off base here. Right. <laughs> Balaam invites the men uh, to join them in their worship service. But it wasn't just the worship service, like I said, it was an orgy. It was the idea of very Greek was practicing in, in, in Corinth. Is if you were praying for virility, if you're praying for children, um, you can just pray about it, or you can um, have a cheerleader <laughs> making you feel more virile. And so it was done ritually. I mean, it was done praying, right? It was praying for the gods to to bless you and and, and have you get over all your infertility. So what happened is a lot of the guys after the worship service fell in love with the women, got married. And uh, mm -hmm. they go back to their tents and that's where Joshua, remember he stands up and says, this has gone too far. Mm -hmm. That what Balaam really did was undermine um, our faith. It, now this idolatry, you know, you're, you're participating in worship services, you're bringing the women home. And he goes and, and if you remember, kills pretty brutally this one guy in his tent. So uh, a lot of, um, fortunately, the Bible doesn't have a lot of sex and violence. And, 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 and you know, so we can, but and Korah is the same type of story of violence. So he's going to refer to all those, which means the readers knew their Old Testament stories pretty well, because these are not stories a couple of them we turn to, but we don't turn to all of them. So when you hear that, you'll go, huh, got to look that one up. There. I can't find anything about Cora, really. And number 1633. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> My book ties that. <laughs> yeah. Um, God got it back. And <laughs> all the way to, um, and let's see, I say 311 too. I don't know what that, um, um, so that's the Korah's rebellion. Again, that's not about sex. That's more about rebellion. Uh, okay. Balaam's error is also in Numbers, and uh, the way of Cain is Genesis uh, four two. So again, it it, it kind of shows you they're they're using their Bibles here. They're using the stories that they learned in Sunday school, so to speak. And these were, uh, we all have stories that we remember from Sunday school. So if I were to talk about Samson, yeah, everybody goes, ah, Samson, right? We don't use him much in sermons. So you learned that back in the day. And they have all these stories as part of their repertoire. Any questions there? Now this was, um, before we roll the tape, this was always an issue. I should say two things about this um, behavior and faith. They're all 
these teachers misusing Paul. Remember how Paul said, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Right. So now you're free in Christ, so let's follow the law. Okay. And they're going, I like that. <laughs> so God's going to forgive me, so eat, drink, and be merry. So there's not this connection between um, the faith in justification, as Paul would say, and in behavior. And so here, Jude is going, you got to watch your behavior, too. You just got to watch your behavior. It's got to link up. Otherwise, they're not acknowledging the authority of Jesus. Okay. That's the same issue that Methodists had with Lutherans. Oh, we were drinking. <laughs> exactly. I can attest. <laughs> Pick a point. <laughs> Lutherans were uh, all about freedom, you know, Paul's teaching. This was kind of our gift to the body, justification by faith, mm -hmm. which meant, especially for Germans, not necessarily for the Swedes and the Norwegians, but for the Germans, uh, for example, drinking, that was actually part of your Sunday um, ritual. You go to church, you go to the <laughs> yeah. but not just in October. <laughs> There was a November fast and a yeah. December fast, a January fast. And it's just part of, um, and I remember that from our own little town in Illinois, Glen, Glenwood. They had a Methodist church, a Baptist church, and then a Lutheran, German Lutheran church came in. And you can read uh, in the minutes of the town council that they built a beer garden right by the train station which upset them greatly. But what really upset them is the Lutherans would leave church on Sunday and go to the beer garden, which was like mind boggling if you're a Methodist, right? Because- Damn to hell, right? <laughs> Damn to hell. You're a, te you're a teetotaler <laughs> and, you know, they, they have to be heathen. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw this in um, when the African delegation visited us in Germany. Uh, they just couldn't deal with the fact that, first of all, we took them to the, um, we had a Thanksgiving service, and it's not like the American Thanksgiving service, but they still had a thankful thankful service for the harvest. And you had a cornucopia on the altar with all these vegetables coming out. For them, that was like the ancient uh, um, rituals to the gods, okay. what the missionaries taught them not to do. Uh -oh. And then all the Germans wanted to show them their filial piety, so they took them to the graveyards. You know, would say if you've been to a German graveyard, they're just immaculate, they're beautiful. But that looked like ancestor worship. Oh. Then they took them out to a beer garden. Oh. Not only did they drink beer, they dropped that little uh, uh, stuff oh, no. into the beer. Oh. What's that, a, a boiler maker? Yeah, yeah, uh, oil maker. Right, Janet. I don't I'm know right, <laughs> And, and so you you know, or you you down the, the drink and the beer. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a shot of whiskey and a beer. How are they? Well, news to me. <laughs> so I'm with Janet. I, <laughs> <laughs> Here's the point that they, they couldn't believe that the Germans were still Christian because of the way they've been taught how a Christian was to act. You know, you and in our church, you know, because I went there to serve as a missionary later on. You couldn't dance because dancing oh, was considered well, yeah, I stand. <laughs> worst ever. Right. My right. famous line, a horizontal or watch. I just know the curtain bell. Let's see, I can't remember how to say it now. I'll remember it before we do. Well, that, was the, <laughs> that was the old joke at Wheaton, yeah. you know, when they started dancing at Wheaton, which is only like about vertical fulfillment of a horizontal desire. There <laughs> dancing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just wait for let the, the say. <laughs> but and I think you got in the news week is is um, the joke on Wheaton's campus is they didn't want you to have premarital sex because it might lead to dancing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the whole idea though is this connection, and Methodists always had this problem with Lutherans because Lutherans would say it's it's only about faith, only faith matters even the faith of the pastor. And Methodists were going, no, the pastor has to show some um, piety. And what, what they meant by piety 
was uh, holy living. So that's why the, the Methodists had a book of disciplines. Disciplines were how you had to live. Mm -hmm. Lutherans never had that. And it's sort of this classic debate going all the way now back to Jude, where look at these pastors, right? Is faith enough or are we expecting some modicum of piety so that we can believe what they're saying? And this goes to some of the other books, right? We'll talk about elders of the church, um, uh, a husband with only one wife, like a bishop. Like right? they're they're going down the list, you know, uh, sober, not uh, given to drunkenness, and um, children respected. This is the one my father just, you know, he'd always read us the riot act because he felt like if his kids were rebellious, he couldn't be a pastor. I mean, that, that was like a big deal for him. It says deep in your relationships, you'll have the discipline to book. Now, interestingly, now the ELCA has a, a book of discipline, but they don't call it a book of discipline. They call it a book of uh, boundaries. They call it boundary violations. So you have to agree. <laughs> you have to agree to stick within certain parameters, but just on certain things. You can te te you know, cheat on your taxes, nobody's gonna throw you out of the pulpit, but you know, if you're sleeping around, of course, then you gotta go. So they, so interestingly, even though we never had classically the Methodist book of discipline, now we sort of do, now we sort of do. It's also subjective. Mm -hmm. Oh no, they're worried about being sued. Yeah. Well, that's it's, it's legal. And uh, that's why they do it. It's um, back in the day, no one could sue. But of course, and they're not worried that a manual will be sued. Or, you know, if you sue a manual nowadays as a congregation, the lawsuits go up. So then it would go to the Senate and maybe even to the. So that would happen, let's say, when I was at Luther, we had to uh, do some tests to protect us because if a student went out as an intern, for example, in a congregation, we know that with Sunday schools now or with um, preschools or wherever you have, and a teacher abuses a child, everybody gets sued. It's not just the family or the person, it's the preschool, it's the Sunday school, it's the church, it's the, student, it's the church at large. Um, and we had that a famous case with a student from Trinity Seminary in Ohio, and they just didn't know. So, you know, he was a pedophile and, and it didn't come out in the psychological tests. And then the question is, who's responsible? Who And lawyers love it when they have a church because then you can sue everybody. Oh, yeah. So that's why we say it's more legal now. Everybody wants to prevent lawsuits. It's risk management. It's not about holiness. And that's my cynical view on that. Well, All right. Then that happened at Trinity because you know David was president of Trinity. I hope it wasn't under his reign. Uh, 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 do you remember the president? Um, he lives out in uh, Colorado now. I should start thinking of his name. Oh, um, Andrews. Um, Andrews. No, no. no so he was Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, you would have known. Well, like, this yeah, was a national yeah, scandal. It was a national scandal and. That's where the church said, you know, get out the lawyers. I remember they, they would invite me to retreats. And after hearing from lawyers, you were just scared to death. That oh, anything yeah. you did it could be seen. Yeah. I mean, every little thing. Not and twiddle. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's not the spirit of Jude here. It's not about lawyers. But it is about these pastors and what type of piety, Christian behavior, sanctification, holiness can, should one expect, Right. And that's where he's attacking, saying, you're inviting these people in. Look at how they get drunk every night, come back and say, Jesus forgave me. That's the best. All right. We ready to jump in? Remember 15 of 25 verses from 2 Peter? Right? You can have that in front of you if you want. Um, and brother of Jesus. Pretty cool. Thank you. 
The letter of Jude, or more accurately, Judah, according to the pronunciation of his name, both in Greek and in Hebrew. Judah was one of Jesus' four brothers who are named in the Gospel accounts. None of the brothers followed Jesus as the Messiah before his death, but afterwards they saw him alive from the dead and then became his disciples. All these brothers of Jesus became leaders eventually in the first Jewish Christian communities, and Judah was known as a traveling teacher and missionary. And this gives us the background to understand the purpose of his letter. We don't know what specific church community he wrote to, but it was likely made up of mostly Messianic Jews. His writing style assumes a deep knowledge of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, as well as other popular Jewish literature. Jude had become aware of a crisis facing this church, and so this helps us understand the letter's design. It begins with an opening charge, followed by a long warning and accusation against corrupt teachers who had influenced this church. And then Judah closes by completing the charge about what this church is supposed to do. Judah begins by charging this church to contend for the true Christian faith. He says his plan was to write a longer work that explored our shared salvation through the Messiah. But that project, he says, got delayed when he heard the urgent news about this church, and so he fired off this very thoughtful but very short letter. Judah doesn't begin with how they're supposed to contend for the faith. Rather, he first goes into why. It's because of the corrupt teachers who have infiltrated this church. And it's not their teaching that he targets, but their way of life. Their moral compromise is what tells you they have bad theology. First of all, they've distorted God's grace as a license to sin. They think that they're forgiven and they have God's spirit, so now they can do whatever they want, especially when it comes to money and sex. And so Judah says they betray Jesus by rejecting his authority and his teachings. And Judah wants this church to know that the appearance of these teachers is no surprise. He transitions into a longer warning to stay away from them. He first offers two sets of three Old Testament examples. The first trio is about rebellious people who in the past received divine justice. So the Israelites who rebelled against God in the wilderness, they got what they wanted and they died out in the middle of nowhere. Then he brings up a story about angels who are imprisoned for rebellion until they face God's justice. He's referring to the interpretation of the story in Genesis 6 offered in the popular Jewish work called First Enoch, where the sons of God are interpreted to refer to angels who rebelled against God, then had sex with women, and were judged accordingly. Judah links this story to his third example about the ruin of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis, where violent men tried to have sex with angels. Both these stories are about rebellion against God's order that led to sexual immorality, and that's precisely what the corrupt teachers are guilty of. After this, Judah brings up a bonus example from a popular Jewish text called the Testament of Moses. Like Enoch, it was not part of the Old Testament scriptures, and it was a creative retelling of Moses' final days and words based on Deuteronomy. In the section that Judah quotes from, Moses has died, and there's a good angel, Michael, who is refuting the devil's accusations against Moses, but he decides to leave final judgment for God alone. Now, these stories might seem kind of odd to you, but for Jewish people who were raised on this literature, Judah's warnings make good sense. The behavior of these corrupt teachers has ancient roots, rebellion against God's authority, sexual immorality, rejecting God's messengers. And this connects to the second trio of examples. They're all about rebels who went on to corrupt other people. So Cain, he murdered his brother, but then he went on to build a city where violence reigned. Balaam, the sorcerer, he couldn't curse Israel, and so he lured them into idolatry and sexual corruption. And then Korah, the Levite, he led a rebellion against Moses that ended in disaster for others. Judah concludes the second trio with a barrage of Old Testament images to describe the teachers. They're like the selfish shepherds of Ezekiel, or like the clouds with no rain from Proverbs, or like the chaotic waves from Isaiah. Their self-absorption betrays their claim to follow Jesus. They create chaos wherever they go. Judah concludes his warning by quoting from two other warnings, one ancient and one recent. The first comes, again, from the popular book of First Enoch, which claimed to contain the visions of the ancient figure Enoch from the book of Genesis. Now what's fascinating is Judah quotes from the opening chapter of Enoch, which is itself quoting about half a dozen Old Testament texts about the final day of the Lord's justice on human evil. Judah then matches Enoch's ancient warning 
with a more recent one from the apostles. Peter, John, Paul, they all predicted that corrupt teachers would arise and distort the good news about Jesus. And they themselves were echoing Jesus' early warning about the same thing. And so this church should need no more convincing. These teachers have to be dealt with. So Judah then moves into his closing charge. He picks up his opening line about contending for the faith and he unpacks how to do so with a cool set of metaphors. He describes the community of Jesus as God's new temple. And so they are to build their lives on the foundation of the most holy faith, which refers to the core message of good news about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for our sins. On that foundation, the church is to build itself through a dedication to prayer, by devoting itself to the love of God through obedience. And the integrity of this building will be maintained by staying alert for the return of Jesus to bring his justice and his mercy. And in doing this, they will help each other stay faithful to Jesus. Judah then concludes by praising the God who will protect his people and keep them from falling too far from his grace. The short letter of Judah is powerful and puzzling for many modern readers who ask why he quotes from texts that aren't today considered part of the Hebrew Bible, like First Enoch or the Testament of Moses. It's important to remember that Jewish culture in this time was immersed in religious texts. Jesus, his family, all the early Jewish Christians grew up reading the Hebrew Bible along with many later books that were based on and inspired by the scriptures. And we know there were ancient debates about whether or not some of these later book should be viewed as scripture, but regardless, they're still important. A book doesn't have to be in the Bible to speak an important message to God's people. And so we have many Jewish texts from this period. They're known today as the collections of the Apocrypha, also called the Deuterocanon, along with the Pseudepigrapha. These were all preserved and read in Jewish and Christian communities. They were treated with great respect. It doesn't mean they were originally designed as part of the Hebrew Bible, but they are part of the biblical tradition. And so Judah, knowing his readers that they would value words from First Enoch, he used them to communicate his message, which is this. God's grace through Jesus demands a whole life response, not just intellectual assent. Notice that Judah doesn't criticize or focus on the teacher's theology, but their immoral way of life, which denies Jesus. And so Judah is here applying what Jesus first told his disciples. If you really love me, then you will obey my teachings. For Christians, how you live is the most reliable indicator of what you actually believe. And that's what the letter of Jude is all about. Actions speak louder than words. Well, that's that's what would be. That's big. Not just for Jews, right? We've seen that before. Especially for the leaders, but for all of us, right? Yeah. Uh, it's the that the line. Um, you might be the only Bible your that's your neighbor read this week, huh? and they're not reading your your faith or your ideology or your theology. They're looking at how you live. That's one of my favorite things. I might be the only Bible that my neighbor see today on mm -hmm. this week. Yeah. I've never heard that before. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, not just talk about neighbors, talk about your family. Your family. Grandchildren. Right, right. grandchildren, children, you know. daughters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they and they never stop looking. We know because we never stop looking at our own parents, right? They they have influence. You, you don't think you do, and then you realize you, you really do. Are well, they like some Twitter and, and people in your congregation. I remember as a child um, walking to church with Mrs. Hunt. Now, Mrs. Hunt never testified to me about her faith, but her walk every Sunday to church was, you know, a screaming testament. And fortunately for me, I thought when I, I was in the third grade, my grandparents brought me to Florida because my grandfather was having trouble 
and Mrs. Hunt continued to walk to church. And at 80 something, uh, she keeled right over in her pew and died. Oh, God bless her. That was, you know, that. God. So, you know, she never said and practiced or told me about her faith, but she walked her faith. Yeah, right. literally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember Mrs. Street, you know, talking about walking to church. Uh, she, she had a very, very large dairy farm about a mile from, uh, from the church. And uh, she, she taught me Sunday school. I worked on the farm with her. I remember her husband thought it was crazy that she had two Bibles. He just thought that was the dumbest thing. Uh, <laughs> she had one on her, her bed stand and one on her office table. And, you know, why do you need two Bibles? You know, just wherever I am, I get to read it. You know, I mean, it was uh, kind of a constant back and forth between the two of them. Uh, but one Sunday, uh, we had a massive snowstorm. And my mother said, I still remember, we're not going to church. We are just not going to church. And she made a very special meal for us. And uh, we roasted chestnuts. The first time I had that as a child, roasted chestnuts on an open fire, literally. But dad said, I got to go. And mom said, but nobody's going to come. Why risk it? It's, it was a blizzard. We were on a typical road, the whole thing. He said, Mrs. Street will be there. <laughs> and in fact, three of them worshiped together. The organist, my dad, and Mrs. Street, who climbed out of a second story window oh onto God. the front oh porch, climbed God. down, walked a mile. I mean, it's kind of classic, <laughs> right? Walked a mile to church. And dad came back and, you know, after we laughed about it, he said, can you imagine if she had been the only one to show up and I hadn't shown up? I mean, can you yeah. imagine... You know, when she went to the nth degree. Yeah, yeah. Whichever. Yeah. So um, behavior there, we knew she'd be there. My dad knew she she was going to be there. And sometimes it's nice if, if our family or our friends can rely on us like that. Mm -hmm. Anything else for, uh, that you picked up on? I would like to see more availability of the those books that are talking about. I, I have a copy of the Apocrypha, and I never could figure out why some were included in, you know, like the Book of Wisdom. Every Catholic funeral I've ever gone to quotes from the Book of Wisdom. Mm -hmm. and uh, it, It's on our lectionary list, too, mm -hmm. but because we share that with Roman Catholics, that, uh, they'll give you a wisdom or and then they'll choose another Old Testament text mm -hmm. for the Protestants. Yeah, but when you talk about the Apocrypha, the books that he mentions are part of what we now consider the Apocrypha. Yeah. I, I thought they were. I thought they were part of the Deutero um, text, so I don't think that the Apocrypha are not in the, the list I have. I, know I have with the Apocrypha in it. Do you have yours? No, yeah, well, it's not in my Bible and my my Bible's a Catholic Bible, so it has some apocryphal books in it. But not first either. Does it have first either? Oh, no, it doesn't have no, no. No. So you have Maccabees, you have other Tobias, Wisdom. Um, Judas, so Judas. You, remember, he listed three different collections. Mm -hmm. um, so the Apocrypha is one, but then the Deuterocanonical uh, gathering is another. And then he mentioned a third one. I can't get it. Pseudo. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I don't know that. I never, I all three different collections, all coming from the same period, right, yeah. of the Maccabees, mm -hmm. uh, between uh, Malachi yeah. and Jesus. So the Protestant Bible, basically, God stays quiet for about 300 years, right? Yeah. Malachi to, to Matthew. But not in, but people were still writing. So you have these collections of literature in, in those 300 years. Right. And then again, there's a very complex history about which ones are included, which ones are not included, but they're all valued. And of course you have other gospels as well. So it gets complex after a while. You know, why did the church choose certain books? Why did the church yeah. choose other well, books? It's, it's all, it's all. That was what I was going to have, like, if they're so valued, like, what, just to read them out kind of. We say, oh, it's important, but but it's not in this book, and and I I don't understand that. Part well, I I read um, 
I read Martin Luther. I wouldn't put him in scripture, but I think he's a inter great interpreter of Paul. Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer. Uh, love his cost of discipleship, but I wouldn't put it in scripture, right? So uh, even though valued as, as a teacher of the church or as a theologian mm -hmm. or, or a devotional writer, I've heard sermons that have moved me, um, which I just thought were brilliant. But again, would you put that in scripture? Then you, of course, have to say, what are the standards? Give scripture the authority in you know, it has to have broad authority. Its authority has to be recognized quite broadly. But Roman Catholics have a different list than Protestants, than uh, Orthodox. Mm -hmm. yeah. We each drive from different traditions as, they, as you put together your Bible. Anyway, this is interesting because he's quoting non biblical sources and those sources that somehow really kind of become authoritative in the process, mm -hmm. if you're quoting them, right? At least the quotes themselves. Mm -hmm. But Paul does the same thing. Philippians, remember, uh, adds that beautiful song to begin with. Where did that song come from? Was it a hymn book? Or who wrote it? You know, and we don't know. It, Paul didn't write the song. He's quoting someone else's material. So you got all that literature buzzing around. And it'd be like a sermon today. Uh, you know, sometimes I would quote someone and I'll name them, bon, as Bonhoeffer said. Mm -hmm. Other times you can quote things and people know exactly, because we've all read the literature. I wouldn't have to make reference to who said it, because everybody would know. If I broke out and would sing, just as I am without one plea, many of you would be thinking, Billy Graham. He didn't write it, but he used it. But he used it. And that it comes more complicated then, too, because he didn't write it. He used it. That's how most of us received it. But then you have to ask the other people then who wrote it? Right? I can tell you by next week. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, two okay. weeks. That's right. Right. Anything else on all those lines? What do we pull from Jude? This is a little book. This is probably one of those books you're you're not going to read often, right? This is not the one you go, oh, I need comfort. I know, I'll read you. <laughs> um, like you would some other books. And yet there's some, this, this is almost a book you might want to read as a congregation rather than as an individual. And the doxology is often repeated. Yeah, correct. Let's read that because that's good because that you're exactly right. Uh, that's often that's the piece that's often quoted here. Yeah. So you want to read that? Oh, okay. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. It doesn't matter. <laughs> to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Stay the course. Stay faithful. And God is faithful. God, God. well, you know, because sometimes, you know, you feel so weak that I can't, I can't finish the race. I just can't. I just don't feel up to it. And here, to who, who is able to keep you from falling. And to present you before, it's all about what God is able to do. God can present you um, before his glorious presence without fault with great joy, right? Wow. That's, it's all about God's activity, not about us. Can you finish the race mm -hmm. strong, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let's get together in, in two or three groups, it looks like. And uh, like what group? Right, right. And I think you have to ask the question. How might you use you? What will you remember? But how would you use it? Like I said, I, I came away with saying, I probably wouldn't read this a lot myself, but I, you could read this for a church to say, if we're having trouble with false teachings and, mm -hmm. or uh, behavior, is, having behavioral issues among the, the leadership, mm -hmm. this might be something you can refer to and read collectively. And then point a finger. Well, probably pointing fingers. You're probably yeah. pointing. Uh, now he doesn't name names no. here, does he? And he doesn't chastise or anything. He just says, "Do this." The only thing he does really say with great anger, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. 
avoid that at all costs. <laughs> Mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by group. You know, the classic here, you know, we used to, uh, back in the day, you talk about TV preachers. That's changed, I think, a little bit. But but that was kind of like they're like used car sales when we used to, you know, that yeah. is just for the money. And there is some of that you feel like at three in the morning if you yeah. walk you. Know, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Especially if you see some of the homes they live in. Like, oh, oh, yeah. Um, we had this guy in Minneapolis. Um, I can't remember his name right now. Um, but yeah, you know, he just bought I don't know, five, ten million dollar home, which is fine for a business person, but not, not usually for clergy. <laughs> um, and they challenged him. I can't remember. It's a mega church in, in Minneapolis, and um, they sued him. And it was former Catholics who had been in that church, and they were sort of comparing them to Catholic priests and saying, "No Catholic priest could buy a five to ten million dollar home." Uh, there's got to be something shifty. And they sued him. The lawyers then gave up on the suit because he gathered mm -hmm. in a group of other pastors who all made similar salaries. Mm -hmm. So what he claimed was, I'm just abiding by the standards of the group that I fellowship with. It's fine for the Catholic priests that you refer to to meet the standards that are set by their denomination. And we hold each other accountable also, but to different standards. There it was. They had to let them off because it met communally recognizing. Yeah, but I think part of it was uh, there was a mixture, um, and I'm trying to identify with Jude here, uh, of, of pastors where you weren't sure whether the church was a platform for selling merchandise mm -hmm. and other books and teaching paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was started by. Um, Crystal Cathedral, um, Robert Schuller. Robert yeah. Schuller. And after a while, you didn't know, you assumed that the church was independent. But then you found out it was really a family yeah. business. That's why they always had to pick a family member to take over the church, because the church had given up all sorts of rights to mm -hmm. uh, all the broadcasts were private, all the merchandise, all the books, those were all part of the family business. And I think only the service itself was the nonprofit. Or, mm -hmm. so, so a lot of people picked up on Schuler and built ministries that linked business and um, and your typical church work, so to speak. So Boy, um, and no one, a lot of people went to those churches didn't care what was going on behind the scenes. They just wanted to go and have a, a good worship service. But behind the scenes, there were all these businesses uh, being um, conducted and making all sorts of, all sorts of fun. Uh, so if you saw someone, even if, you, you, if you're on TV and you're asking for donations, that was not part of Schuler's ministry. That was private. That was no, part of Crystal Cathedral's no, ministry. It's all, yeah. all business, all family, <laughs> all family business. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah, you, we... you take it for granted that that's part of the church's ministry. Yeah. 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 Well, they don't represent it at all. We assume that's our assumption. Yeah. But they let it, they let it be assumed. Yeah, they don't. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then if you ask, they'll, they'll go into all the, it's a complex relationship. So he had like 20, 30 ministries, all those were I think the majority of private businesses. Again, tied it in with Jude. Yeah. Jude would say, huh? You know, that is, that's just greed. That's so, that's not, or it's not transparent. If, if yeah, it's it's more transparent, yeah. then I could decide, right? But if I don't know, I think, this is just yeah. a, a ministry yeah. by, by you remember yeah. we had a car dealer in uh, oh. Columbus that was kind of jokingly known to the whole population as the Christian crook. Oh. Oh. Um, yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> just take a couple minutes and, and connect again. What are your what are your takeaways then? Where are you going?
you know, as I was thinking about that yeah. now, we don't, we could read it along with some of the other smaller letters that we, um, you know, first, second Peter, uh, first, second, third John, always the worry about false teachers. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, you know, we don't have the traveling evangelists visiting house churches like they did at the time. What we do, though, is we have Christian broadcasting networks. Yeah. Yes. We have books. We have people who really influence. And every once in a while, uh, someone breaks out on some teachings that are having a big impact. And we would say are harmful. Now, it's usually about doctrine. So if I were to name, let's say, Christian nationalism, as I said, it's a, it's a heresy. Uh, they just mix up um, the teaching of patriotism and love of Jesus. But you had prosperity gospel that has had a huge amount of influence. Uh, not a whole lot in the Lutheran Church, but maybe a little bit. Uh, I remember back in the 70s, uh, Tim LaHaye, you know, the Left oh, Behind really? series, those things that we'll discuss those during the book of Revelation. But notice those were all pretty much about doctrine. What makes Jude, I think, interesting and unique is it's about the behavior yeah. of the, of the yeah. evangelists. Yeah. And often we don't know about these, you know, you read a book and or you see someone on TV, you don't know what they're no. it's like at all. And, uh, we don't know the private life of our own pastors. No, I, I pushed back on that a little bit. I pushed back on that a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Steve, we knew what he was going through, for yeah. example, with his son. We knew what he was going through with his divorce. Uh, divorce. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, pretty not completely open, but. I, I think yeah, people I knew what was happening with my wife, Nina. Kids are here, so it's not like you you won't know everything. No. But um, it's also not hidden either. Like someone who just sells a book mm -hmm. or someone, uh, all you know is their TV persona. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Right. Uh, now, interesting with the Crystal Cathedral, he would bring on his family, you know, and that, but it was all... TV, it's all production, mm -hmm. and that's very different. And then all of a sudden, when we hear, I mean, the classic would be uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. Yeah, I mean, good gracious, yeah. you know, when you found out what his private life was like, that was nothing compared to what he he presented as the president of Liberty, Liberty or. Or you know, as a prominent I mean, they, political figure, Tammy Faye and I don't know, yeah. Tammy, another good example. They had more conditions for the dogs, by the way, than I have. They don't put the dog out. Well, can I look at that? Yeah, good for the dogs. Let the cats sweat. But, <laughs> um, so we find out those things, you know, or, or you see some uh, pastor who's got. You know, forty thousand foot mansion. You know, square foot mansion in Texas somewhere. You're in a private helicopter pad, and you know, you're going, well, what, what, what? You know, maybe that's not up and up. But you usually only found that out behind after the, the fact. Point being, again, normally we go after the teaching of a false teaching that's having influence. Dude is going after behavior and saying mm -hmm. that's reflective of someone who does not accept. The lordship of Jesus, the authority of Jesus in their lives. It's not someone who makes mistakes. You know, because if we're under the authority of Jesus and you make mistakes, you repent. And you can tell someone who has a right. humble um, attitude versus someone who's abusing. So I think it's, I think it makes you, uh, a Jew quite unique here and, and quite useful for him. Uh, we're not going to have uh, the prayer today, only because I'm meeting with an old friend of ours, uh, Carol Langseth. Oh, no, Carol no, McKay. Okay. We, Carol McKay, okay. <laughs> we are uh, doing a Sunday forum for September 28th, but we're going to tape it today on whether you can talk to your loved ones after they die. 
what is our teaching about? Should you talk to your loved ones oh, after no, they die? Is wondrous. it possible? Is it healthy? Is it Christian? Or do they know things that happen? Yeah. I was firmly convinced that my grandmother knew when we adopted Joanna. And I talked to the pastor and he said, well, if they really could see or know what was going on here, would they ever have peace? Uh, and I said, isn't there a celestial filter? <laughs> but the old nobody celestial could, filter. <laughs> nobody could convince me that my grandmother didn't know that. Well, we started this because uh, often in grief literature, you're encouraged to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us who've lost loved ones do that quite naturally. That's why you go to the cemetery. That's why you go to special places, maybe even mm -hmm. in your house. So you're often taught to do that. It's healthy. Mm -hmm. um, but in the Old Testament, it's usually condemned the two-way dialogue, mm -hmm. often through the use of a medium, Yes, right? Interesting, the Old Testament doesn't say it, it can't happen. They say, don't do it. Mm -hmm. So Julie checked with her grief um, professional group, and they flipped out. They said, don't do that. That's against scripture. And, she, and, and of course, we often teach that as a psychological healing method. So that's what we're going to present, that there's a little, little, little conflict there. Not too bad about uh, what, what's a, a good grieving technique mm. and uh, maybe where the limits. <laughs> don't pay someone to yeah. talk to your loved one. So there you go. Uh, so we're going to film that today uh, and we're going to do it together at our two churches. So we'll discuss oh. that here on 28th and she'll discuss it at Emmanuel in, in Michigan on the 28th. Uh -huh. And then we'll find out uh, how that all works together, what we, what we learned from the conversation. So. And that was her idea. I thought it was a really, really creative one and a good one. So let's end with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the brother of Jesus, Judah. And we pray that we would learn as a church that you would give us a good leaders, Lord, who uh, teach us in the way, who rely on your mercy. But above all, we Thank you that you promised to bring us before the throne of grace, holy and acceptable. We pray and thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, so when will you be leaving for your trip? Sunday. Have a safe trip. The leaves, I don't think will have turned in Wisconsin yet. I don't know. Even up that north. Well, oh, no. late September. Or, yeah. yeah probably probably early. Northern part might. Yeah, yeah that's right. earlier. Yeah. yeah, that's nice up there. That's fine. That'd be really good. Yeah, I'm going to tell her.